There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another, in other words, this is an occasional series where I talk about vocabulary, idioms, grammatical patterns, anything linguistic like that, that I encounter in my reading. I am not an expert in these matters, as I always like to remind people. I just love doing etymological and lexicographical deep dives on the internet. So w without further ado, let's get started. I have four different books to feature vocabulary from. And the first one is this short story, uh, individually published, Sylvia Plath's Mary Ventura and the Ninth Kingdom. This is part of the Faber Story series published this year to mark Faber's 90th anniversary. This was one of the first ones that I read. I'm having a series of video discussions with Doris of all the books on these as we read through them together. This one, I didn't really care for too much. I think it was a three-star read. And there was one piece of vocabulary in there that made me go to Google, and that was, I believe, one of the young uh, girls on the train is described as being toe-headed. And I don't know if I'd ever heard it. Certainly didn't know exactly what it meant. But toe-headed means that you, the person, has a head of very light blonde hair, almost white. What's the uh, Billy Idol? in the 1980s, toe-headed, maybe. So why do we say toe-headed? What's the toe part? Uh, one meaning of toe comes from the old English word with the same spelling, means the coarse, broken fibers of flax, hemp, etc., separated into the finer parts. So those would probably be of that whitish blonde color in English since the late 14th century. Also, going into the textile process that flowed from perhaps some of those grains, which was spinning. Tolik meant in around the same time, fit for spinning, or a spinning room. Perhaps it's connected to the Gothic word, Gothic, what's that, German? I don't know. Toljen, which means to do or make. There's a Middle Dutch word, Toen, which means to knit or weave. Going back to the Proto-Germanic Ta, T-A-W, which meant to manuf manufacture. So let's move to ta. I don't think it's used at all anymore, but it meant to prepare something, especially leather, and came from the Old English tawion, which meant to prepare or make ready, cultivate, or uh, also another meaning was harass, insult, or outrage. Been a lot of that on booktube these days. And that one goes back to that same root, ta. So just to clarify, the color, the very light blonde hair, comes from the, the grains, where, and that also flows out of the spinning and the making and the manufacturing. But it's also connected, and I guess you could easily see how it makes the jump, into the word that we all use as tool, which is an instrument that somebody uses to make something. Um, and that goes back to the same root, the same Old English root, tawion, and back to ta. There you go. The bulk of the vocabulary that I have for you today is from a very new Irish novel that I read and quite enjoyed. Didn't really care for the ending, but otherwise really, really liked it. And it's called Leonard and Hungry Paul by Ronan Hessian. Just published this year, and I read it shortly after it came out. And a whole pile of vocabulary, a, a, a smattering of it is Irish English, perhaps, but most of it is just, you know, British English. Some of it goes, you know, isn't even necessarily British English, but he made interesting choices of words. The first one I found was a phrasal verb, faffing about. Don't think I'd ever heard of it. Certainly hadn't paid attention, if I had. It turns out I do a lot of faffing about, and maybe you do too. Faffing about means to do things in a disorganized way and not accomplishing very much. It's an informal British phrasal verb. Um, phrasal verb, if that's too jargony, just means a verb that has more than one word, usually two words, like hang out or eat out. Faffing about is a phrasal verb. Uh, pretty much only in the UK do you hear this. And in modern times, it's somewhat an anachronistic. 
apparently B.G. Wodehouse used it in his stories, a little bit old-fashioned. The word faff has been used to mean dither or fuss since the 19th century. Faff comes from faffle, and that word has been used, had been used since the 16th century with exactly the same meaning, although it did have faffle had an additional meaning, which meant to flap idly in the breeze. So there's another use of faff, rarely recorded, but in an Australian uh, newspaper from 1879, a, a candle flame is described as faffing about, not flapping, right? So it was uh, prevalent in the among the working classes in Australia, late 19th century, of course, the, the, the people were mainly uh, English-speaking uh, ex-convicts. So rather a, a lower class rather than upper class. The next phrase that I found is the oxters. And if you know this word, you know why I'm posing this way. It means a person's armpit. It's uh, Scottish and Northern English. And it means an armpit. So in from this novel, Leonard and Hungry Paul... The sentence is, he went to the bathroom to spit out the morning goo and gave himself a standing wash with a face cloth, the oxters and Adam and Eve areas being the priority, which gives you a flavor of the, of the, uh, the gentle wit of the story. I found uh, some etymologist, uh, whether he's amateur or what, I don't know, uh, saying that he grew up in County Mayo in Ireland and often heard it. And if you're up to your armpits, in they would say up to your oxters means to, very busy. Found in dialects in Ireland, Scotland, England, and the Isle of Man. But it can also refer not only to the armpit, but the underside of the upper arm, or to the fold of the arm when bent against the body. I'm actually not sure what that means. The fold of the arm when bent against the body. I can't quite picture that. And also to the armhole of a coat or jacket. It's also used as a verb, the OED uh, lists these as to support by the arm, walk arm in arm with, take or carry under the arm, to embrace, to put one's arm around. All those are meanings of the verb, to oxter. Uh, earliest example in Robert, Robbie Burns. The priest he was oxtered, the clerk he was carried. That is the first occurrence of the verb. The noun goes centuries back. It's very complicated, it seems to be of a Germanic origin. Back to Old Saxon, Old High German, and I won't try to pronounce all these variants. Regional Norwegian, and there's many, many spellings. But it's, they don't seem to be able to agree. There's no fascinating, oh, this is the Proto-Indo-European root. We don't have any of that information. It's found in Newfoundland English, too. How fascinating. Absail. The central romance in the the Leonard half of the Leonard and Hungry Pete story is that he meets the woman of his dreams when there is a practice fire drill at work, and she is the fire drill coordinator, and she is he's not wanting to leave the building because he's very busy, and she's uh, being very bossy, and uh, that turns into something. He says, well, how should I leave? Well, how do I get out of here? And she said, most people use the stairs, but you can also abseil, dot, 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 dot. So to abseil, I found out, means to go down a very steep slope by holding onto a rope that is fastened to the top of the slope. So that could also, I guess, be on the side of a building. And in U.S., rappel, which I'd heard but didn't know what meant. So it's a very British English term. And this goes back to Scottish. So far, we don't have any specifically Irish-originated uh, Irish vocabulary or uh, solely Irish-originated vocabulary. This word, abseil, was coined by the Scottish Mountaineering Club in 1908. It comes from two German words, ab, meaning down, and sail, meaning rope. So, down rope. There you go. Apparently, it's also used maybe the identical word or a very similar word in French, but it came first into English through the Scottish Mountaineering Club in 1908. Skinny Malink! Or Skinny Malinky. I think Skinny Malinky is the adjective. No, I think they both can be used as noun, and this one is again Scottish, so Ronan Hessian maybe he's got uh, Scottish roots? It means a very thin person. It's not a word you'd ever use to talk about Sean the Book Maniac! <laughs> but it's been used at least four times in the New York Times, so I had never heard of it, but it did cross the pond. 
either a British or American occurrence. 1870, it was in a comic song on the London stage. The Dictionary of American Regional English has made a guess. Nobody really knows that it comes from skinny as the links of a crook. So skinny my link. Uh, and a crook, apparently, is the chain and hook that hold a pot over a fire. So, skinny my link. The ma is probably an infix. So, this is Joan Hall, a linguist or etymologist, the editor of the Dictionary of American Regional English. And she says that the ma part in skinny my link is an infix, which is just jargon, right? It means a rhythmic syllable added to make the phrase more euphonious. And euphonious just means sounds nice. Um, thingamabob. I can't think of another infix other than ma, but we certainly have them in a lot of words, especially slang. Eddie Cantor in 1924 uh, had a, popularized a song, Skinema Rink. I can't find on YouTube the Eddie Cantor version, but if I can find it somewhere else, I'll put it in here. Otherwise, I'll put in a short excerpt from another cover. Uh, the next one is in rag order, and I, I don't remember if it's Leonard or Paul described that all my pajamas and stuff are in rag order. So it means in a bad way, totally disorganized, all over the place. It also can mean hungover or just plain sick. So it can be a situation, a room, a mess, but it can be a person who's a mess because they drink too much or they are sick. Now, interesting... The only online source I could find that defined rag order was the Urban Dictionary, which isn't all that reliable, but it certainly fits the context of this sentence in the novel and uh, doesn't seem to have been added to any other dictionaries. Next is a mixum gatherum. Just listen to that word. What would you think it meant? It's pretty easy, I think, to guess. It's a miscellaneous or confused collection of persons or things. A hodgepodge, a muddle. I would have thought a mix, a gathering, so people, but it can be just a, a bunch of stuff uh, confusedly thrown together as well. It comes from the mid-19th century, first found in a novel or a writing by John Banham, who died in 1842. He was a novelist and playwright. I've never heard of him. Have you? John Banham. It comes from the classical Latin word mixtum, which is the... Neutral version of mixtus, obviously which from which we get mix, and gatherum after omnium gatherum. I mean, you don't even need the Latin etymolo etymology to piece it together. Right. Next is womble. And here's the sentence. What if Hungry Paul just planned to womble from day to day, forever, unaware that his universe was shrinking? So womble is an informal British verb which means to wander in a casual and relaxed way. So just kind of meander, wander around, no fixed destination. So that could be literal as in walking, or it could be figurative. It comes from Wimbledon Common, which many children have mispronounced over the centuries, Wombleton, and was, I believe, coined by the children's writer Elizabeth Beresford, who died in 2010, and she wrote a series of children's books, and I believe Womble might have been in the title of those, I didn't double check that, and then made into a TV series. And a Womble is a pointy-nosed furry creature, and here is, some, here is a picture or two. They're supposed to live in burrows where they help the environment by collecting and recycling rubbish in cre creative ways. That sounds rather purposeful, but uh, the the word has come to mean just kind of wandering around. This one's a bit obscure, but I thought you might be interested. A tontine. It's a word that means an annuity that's shared by a whole bunch of holders, a whole bunch of subscribers. It, it's held to, 
for a loan or common fund and the shares increase as the subscri the shares that are divvied up annually or whatever i don't it's hard for me to talk about this kind of financial stuff because i don't know anything about money check my bank account but the shares increase as the subscribers die off until the last living survivor of the tontine gets all of the shares until she or he kicks the bucket it comes from the french word same spelling probably different pronunciation and it's named after a neapolitan banker in paris lorenzo tonti who first proposed this financial annu type this type of annuity the next is not so much vocabulary it's just a, it's a thing people a bog body a bog body is a human cadaver that has been naturally mummified in a peat bog for pete's sake sometimes they're called bog people and a disastrous date that leonard has with his new girlfriend is they're going to some museum or something to see the bog bodies but uh, if memory serves things go awry before they even get there but it was a chance to find out what the heck's a bog body they've been found all over the globe the cadavers have been dated back to 8000 bc and some as recent recently deceased as the second world war so you know a body gets dumped into or falls into a bog and it gets mummified partially or fully even the skin it also shows up in a novel that I didn't love, but most people loved, that was long listed for the Women's Prize, Sarah Moss's Ghost Wall. But I had already first encountered it here. So what about bog? A bog has lots of decayed and decaying vegetation and a quicksand-like softness. A quagmire, or a quag, is worse than a bog. It has depths of mud and perhaps a shaking surface a slough is not as serious it's a place of deep mud and perhaps water but generally no vegetation so i think quagmire is the most dangerous bog is pretty darn dangerous and a slough it's just causes one to despond did you see that literary reference a bog is wet, soft, spongy ground with soil chiefly composed of decaying vegetable matter. It's a Celtic. This is where it gets really interesting for me. It goes back to a root, a Proto-Indo-European root. Boog, if I'm pronouncing it right, that's how you spell it, which means to bend. And think of all of these words that descend from that same Boog, Proto-Indo-European root that mean in some way bend akimbo bagel bog bow bow as in an arrow's bow so i didn't know the the verb to bow and the arrow's bow were etymologically related that's fascinating uh how do you pronounce the same noun that means the front of the ship bow i think it's the same as the arrow isn't it but that also comes from the same root buxom <laughs> and elbow all of those are related to the bog but going way back to the boog root fascinating the next word looks like the french word meaning we but is pronounced to rhyme with mouse Nous, and w one of the characters is very well organized, so there is reference made to her organizational nous. I'd never heard of that. It means practical intelligence. It's an informal British English word, but it goes back to philosophy, and the term meant the mind or the intellect, but informally it came to mean something very different from bullshit philosophy. Practical intelligence. I don't have either kind of intelligence. Uh, in English, it goes back to the late 17th century. It comes from the Greek word. I think it may be the same spelling, meaning mind, intelligence, intuitive apprehension. This one, in terms of just the uh, euphoniousness of it, the uh, way it rolls so trippingly off the tongue, which is why it's not only the name of a 
Nabokov novel. I didn't know that. I had never heard of that novel. And a pop group or a punk group or a, some kind of musical group. The term, which comes from heraldry, is bend sinister. Funny, we got the bending of bow and we move right next to bend sinister. So here's the sentence. Hungry Paul and Leonard are sharing a bed because they're in a hotel room because one of their sisters is getting married. He had to draw his legs towards him, slightly, on account of Hungry Paul, who was sleeping across the bed in a position known in heraldry as bend sinister. So, it's, I don't know if it's ever been used in the way that Hessian used it in this sentence, but in heraldry, a bend sinister is a diagonal band that runs from the sinister chief to the dexter base. You, do you know what that means? I didn't. It means that if you're looking at the the heraldic, uh, what do you call it? The heraldic sign, the heraldry thingy, the image, if you're looking at it, it's going from upper right down to lower left. For the where, it would be the opposite left to, to right. So here are some pictures. Most heraldic bands are from, from the viewer's left to the right, and they're called bends, or a bend dexter. But a bend sinister is the one that comes from the other direction, top right to the lower left. If it's a narrow band, whether it's a, just a regular bend, Whichever one it is, this way or this way, if the band is narrow, it's called a bendlet. But it's still a, a bendlet sinister, bendlet uh, dexter. And the bend sinister was a sign of illegitimacy in among the nobility and royalty in Europe. And they had no shame, because even if you were a bastard child of a nobleman or a king you still uh, wanted your heraldic sign or whatever. I don't know what the word is, Her heraldic thingy. The uh, Ben Sinister showed that you were at, of illegitimate descent from the royal or noble personage. I'm showing you images, so just imagine Hungry Paul sleeping that way on the bed. <laughs> Poor Leonard didn't get a very good night's sleep. <laughs> so that's what I've got from that novel, Leonard and Hungry Paul. Hey guys, well, I have been editing this video for about 10 days and I realized that I made it too long. So I'm going to cut it, maybe not exactly in half, but I, you've watched 25 minutes or something like that. So I'm going to save the rest, put it into another video. So that's why I'm wearing different clothes at the end of this video. And then the introduction to the next video, I'll be wearing a different frock. Uh, and I may add some more vocabulary to that second video, but it's just, it's too long for one video. So, I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. In any event, thanks for watching. <laughs>